Good morning. A couple of years ago, I went to Rubio's to get a burrito or something, and I bought a plastic bag, which is made of polyethylene. And I cut it up into a million pieces, and it has um, continued to serve me well since then for this demonstration. So imagine you have a piece of a Rubio's bag, and you tug on it a little bit. And it's a little stretchy. It's a little stretchy before it starts deforming permanently. And that's the elastic regime. It's like a rubber band. The uh, entropic elasticity takes or is the dominant restoring force. So you straighten out the chains. But as you straighten out the chains, you reduce their entropic freedom. So they want to ball back up. And as a result of balling back up, they produce a restoring force. So that's maybe 0 to 10% strain. You can't really see 10% strain from back there, but I can see it here. Then if you stretch it a little bit more, but you stretch it kind of slowly, and then it yields. So you've started to now affect the crystalline domains, and you're starting to break up the crystallites, and now you're breaking them apart, and you're realigning them along the strained axis. Then you continue to stretch out the sample, and you continue to stretch it, and you continue to stretch it. More chains are lining, more crystallites are breaking apart, and then it it breaks. Well, in between when it was being stretched out and when it broke, there was a little bit of loss in the stress per strain. And then, um, uh, and that is the result of bonds breaking and chains pulling out of each other, which is what happens when you break the sample. Um, and at the very end, so many bonds have broken and chains have pulled out that the, the whole sample fractures. Now, that, that is the slow case. Suppose, or the, let's say that's the medium case of straining. What happens if you take this and I just pull on it really fast? It'll break, of course. And it didn't extend very much, did it? This tells us a lot about polymers, that it takes a long time for the chains to realign with their new circumstances, like an external load. What if we had a third piece of the Rubio's bag and we suspended a heavy weight from it and we just waited for days, what would happen? Eventually it would kind of, I'm just going to speed this up, time lapse. Eventually it would go like this and eventually, you know, it could take years, it could take a long time, but eventually it would get to the point where you have ultimate tensile strength and depending on uh, depending on a lot of things, it might break, it might not, depends on how heavy the weight is. But over time, you'll have this phenomenon called creep. Now, now this is a, a phenomenon um, associated with viscoelasticity of polymer samples, where polymers have um, some combination of, uh, of elasticity, which is, attributed, which is like a pure solid, is purely, purely, purely elastic, and viscosity, which is a property of, uh, of liquids, which is uh, viscous. They don't store any energy uh, mechanically. They just dissipate it all, uh, dissipate it all whereas elastic solids um, uh, store all of the mechanical energy. So uh, what does this look like if we were to plot a, draw a plot of stress versus strain for a generic polymer? And stress is force per unit area. And strain is the change in length divided by the initial length, as we discussed uh, last class. So at the very beginning of the process, you have the amor chains in the amorphous domains aligning along the axis of strain. And this is all elastic behavior. But then something happens where the crystallites start to pull apart a little bit. And then when you loosen up all the crystallites, you could have a reduction in, in stress with strain. Not always, but, you could, but it, does, it does happen. Then you have a period where the material strengthens, where the chains start to align again. And because you have covalent bonds that are now aligned with the axis of strain, you have the strongest component of the polymers, which are the covalent bonds along the chain, aligned with the axis of strain. They're providing a lot of, uh, of resistance to mechanical deformation. Then you come to a point, say, around 
here, where the uh, where you start to have bonds, um, uh, you start to have chains that are pulling out of each other. You start to have you can have bond scission events where the mechanical energy overwhelmed becomes concentrated at covalent bonds and they break. And then the material has uh, the the. The stress starts going down with strain until finally uh, it breaks. So this is um, the amorphous chains partially align. Uh, reversibly partially align. This point after you have yield of the polymer, and it's no longer reversible here, this is where you have separation of the chains in the crystallites. Not every material is going to have a stress strain curve like this, but this shows many of the features that it could have. This is where you have uh, realignment of chains. Or strengthening. This is where you have a uh, rupture of covalent bonds and uh, overwhelming of the intermolecular forces between chains that allow them to slide completely past each other. And when enough of this happens, the material uh, bifurcates, or this is catastrophic failure. And the parts of this curve have, uh, have names. The slope here is the tensile modulus, the tensile or Young's modulus. And we call this uh, capital E. And it has units of newtons per square meter, usually expressed just as pascals. At the this point in the curve, we have three points that lie pretty much back to back to back, depending on what type of material it is and what side of the curve you're approaching it from. There is the, uh, the proportionality limit. So you have the stress at PL and the strain at PL. And that's where the stress is proportional to strain. And up until this, up until this point, the slope of this line is the, is the elastic modulus. For uh, most semi-crystalline materials that are not uh, cross-linked, you know, like polythiophene, or sorry, not poly polyethylene, not particularly elastomeric, this could be somewhere around 10%. For silicone rubber, it might be 200%. So this could, could, uh, could vary. Although for silicone rubber, the, it's, it's elastic over a much larger range than the stress is actually proportional to strain. Which brings me to my next point. There could be a region in which 
the stress and the, the stress and the strain are still reversible, so deformability is still reversible, but the stress isn't linearly proportional to strain. And for materials like the um, uh, like the uh, like the Rubio's uh, polyethylene bag, we have the elastic limit. beyond which if you stretch the material anymore, it's going to stay like that. Like, have you ever made faces to your parents and you're like, and they said, don't do that, your face will stay like that. That's when you pass the elastic limit. Yeah. Is that the elastic limit is the maximum of the curve, whereas the proportionality limit is the point? No. The maximum of the curve is the upper yield point which is infinitesimally close to the elastic limit, but on the right-hand side of it. Then we have the lower yield point. So the elastic limit is up to the, is, is as you stretch it out. If you stretch it infinitesimally more than the elastic limit, it's then the upper yield point. Some materials have a lower yield point, others don't. It depends on what happens to the chains as they, uh, as to the crystalline regions as they, as you overcome the activation energy to pull the, to pull the crystallites apart. Sometimes you have a reduction in stress with strain, sometimes it just continues. Interestingly, Stress strain curves for metals can look a lot like stress strain curves for polymers, but the mechanisms are totally different. So if you stretch out a metal, it actually becomes, it becomes strengthened. So you can have a, uh, you can have this behavior where stress continues to increase with strain past the elastic or past, past the, um, the yield point for a metal. And in that case, what's driving the increase in strength is the accumulation of dislocations in the crystal lattice. So the atoms move out of their, uh, their, um, uh, their positions in the crystal lattice and they dislocate to accommodate the plastic flow that you are, uh, you're creating in the sample. That has the effect of what's called strain hardening or strain strengthening the metal. The same effect is observed in, in polymers, but the mechanism is different. In this case, it's actually increasing the amount of order in the system by aligning the chains along the strained uh, axis. The point um, up here is called the ultimate tensile strength. And it has units also of newtons per square meter. And there are a couple of energy density terms that are important. In this region, between zero, between mechanical equilibrium and the elastic limit, is the area under the curve is called the modulus of resilience. Or just the resilience. We never really say modulus of resilience, but it has uh, the uh, the name U sub R from zero strain to the strain at the proportionality limit of the elastic modulus times the strain times D strain, where the stress at the proportionality limit equals the tensile modulus times the strain at the proportionality limit. And since this region is always uh, linear and it's always a triangle, uh, it's, always a, it's, always a, it's always a right triangle, you can actually just write without having to uh, really integrate anything. U of R equals the stress at the PL uh, squared over <laughs> two times the tensile modulus, and this has units of joules per cubic meter in SI units. 
So what is the significance of an energy density? It's that's the amount of, ener of, of energy per unit volume that can be accommodated in the elastic regime. So that's the total amount of energy that you can put in the system mechanically before the, um, uh, before the material is no longer, uh, is no longer proportiona proportionally elastic. And usually, the proportionality limit and the, and the uh, elastic limit and yield point are so close to each other that if you add even just a little bit more energy in here, you'll permanently deform the sample. Yep. So just to be clear, is that E subgroup epsilon or is that E times epsilon? This is E times epsilon. Okay. There's another energy density that's important, and that's called the modulus of toughness. Or just the toughness. And this is the total energy absorbable prior to fracture. That includes the resilience plus all of this area. So total energy density at fracture. And it is U sub T from zero to the strain at fracture of the stress function times DE. And it also has units of joules per cubic meter. Yep. So the elastic limit and the yield point are infinitesimally close to each other. They're basically the same point. But we talk about elastic limit when we're talking about elasticity, and we talk about the yield point when we're talking about yield. It means, yield point means that the material is no longer storing mechanical energy. It's dissipating mechanical energy by deforming permanently. So it's elastic, elastic, elastic. But then there's, a, in, there's an elastic limit. And then infinitesimally more, it's a yield point. You will never have to differentiate between the two in your working life. But they will, but it will be called both. Is that okay? It's just a matter of perspective, whether we're talking about elasticity or uh, or yield. Suppose we have some generic stress strain curve. And we have three samples with stress strain behavior that looks like this. This is strong but not tough. This is strong and tough. This is neither strong nor tough. So when you're talking to somebody who's faced a lot of uh, adversity and overcome a lot of challenges and uh, someone calls them, that's a strong person, you say, no, that's a tough person.
Okay. So that's strength and toughness and resilience. What about, what about modulus? So the modulus is like the spring constant for a three-dimensional solid. It's basically the force equals uh, kx in um, the Hooke's law, where the modulus is the k, but it's really, it's really a three-dimensional solid, not a, not a spring. But it means the same, the same thing. It's how much the thing, how much restoring force in the elastic regime the material provides uh, per amount of, of strain. So if you have, uh, a few different materials and the modulus, and usually moduli are, are quite high. So this is giga newtons per, me, uh, per meter squared, um, or giga pascals. We usually refer to moduli in GPA. And then nu, which is the Poisson ratio from last class, that's the amount something shrinks in the transverse direction relative to the amount that it expands in the stretched direction. So let's look at uh, diamond, graphene, steel. Let's look at glass. polyethylene, and latex. Diamond has a modulus of a terapascal, really strong, no, um, really high modulus. And a Poisson ratio of 0 0.2. Graphene also around a terapascal. Poisson ratio of about 0 0.15. Steel, now this depends on how much carbon is in the steel, but let's say around 200 and 0 0.28. Glass, 60, 0 0.23. Polyethylene, and this would be particularly uh, high molecular weight polyethylene would have a modulus this high, but this is what this is what this reference measured. So that's 24 gigapascals and 0 0.38. As things become more rubber-like, you get closer to 0 0.5 for Poisson ratio, and 0 0.5 is about the most that any natural material, any isotropic material is likely to have, which is 0 0.5. And uh, pure rubber materials like latex really um, max out at, at, at about 0 0.02 gigapascals or 20 megapascals and a Poisson ratio that very nearly approaches 0 0.5, which is going to be the limit for rubbers at 0.49. Now the modulus will be highly dependent on temperature. And where you are particularly in relation to the glass transition temperature. And what you, what you do to measure uh, the modulus as a function of temperature, is you get what's called a relaxation modulus, which means that you apply a uh, that you uh, that you apply a strain, and then you wait a certain amount of time before you measure the force, and you measure the same amount of time before you measure the force before every measurement, so that you're consistent, because we know that the modulus changes, or sorry, that the uh, that the force changes over time when you, when you strain something quickly versus strain, strain something slowly. So this is the uh, relaxation modulus. So 
we say like E sub T equals 10 seconds. So you stretch out the sample and you wait 10 seconds before reading the force gauge, before reading the value uh, of the force gauge. And we'll plot this as a function of temperature in Kelvin. And this is, say, atactic polystyrene. And we'll go from 330 to 370, which is the TG of atactic polystyrene, to 410 to 450. And our modulus will vary over many orders of magnitude. So 10 to the 5, 10 to the 7, and 10 to the 9. So here's our gigapascal marker. Um, atactic polystyrene in the glassy state is going to be uh, is going to be really elastic, really solid like, really glassy. So it's going to be above uh, um, uh, one gigapascal. And its TG is 370. So there's the TG line. And if we plot the, uh, the modulus, once we get to around the TG, it's going to take a nosedive, then plateau out a little bit, and then become basically a, uh, a viscoelastic liquid at the end. So these regimes here, we can label them roughly as the glassy state regime, the, uh, the leathery regime, and this is uh, retarded, uh, highly elastic behavior. And I mean it has time dependence to its elasticity. It's not going to provide a restoring force immediately. Then we have two kind of loosely defined states here. This is the rubbery state where the time dependence partially goes away. But then we have a rubbery flow state. And that could be like uh, marshmallow fluff. Has anyone ever eaten that? Nobody? OK, one person. They might, not, they might not have it in California. Show of hands. OK, all right, good. Okay. And then at, uh, at, at high enough temperatures, you have the viscous state. Now let's look at the time dependence under specific conditions. So let's look at constant stress A constant stress experiment is called a creep test. And the creep test means you put a given strain or a, sorry, a given stress on an object like you hang a weight on it and you measure the elongation over time. Like imagine taking a piece of chewed gum out of your mouth and holding it there for a day. <laughs> That's a creep test where the stress is provided by uh, MG, MG divided by the cross section of the wad of gum. That gives you the stress. Otherwise, it's just the force. So there's your stress. And what does the strain look like? Now, depending on, the, depending on the sample, you might get something that looks like this, some time dependence. So you apply the stress and you measure the elongation. There is an analogous experiment we can do by applying a step strain of some amount and then measuring the stress by means of a force gauge. So you apply the strain, that just means instantaneously stretch it out, and then you, you, have, a, you have your sample between 
uh, with, a, with a force gauge that can measure the way the force evolves over time. Now, the force is going to be greatest at the beginning, and then it might decrease to some, to some value, depending on where we are on the temperature curve. Now, where are we on the temperature curve? And these are called viscoelastic models. And we'll draw them for a couple of the states that we've shown over there on the left. This is the strain versus time for the glassy state. And we are applying step stresses or creeps. These are all creep experiments. We'll call them creeps. If you apply the step stress at T1 and you remove it at T2 for a purely elastic glassy material, the strain instantly responds. You apply the stress and there's instantly a strain of some percentage. This is true for all solid objects, right? Everything we're used to from diamonds to glassy polymers like petri dishes or eyeglass lenses, this is how they'll respond. So far so good? What if we introduce some time dependence? So we say now, oh I should say this is important. This gives you complete elastic recovery. And we can model this as a spring. With some tensile modulus where the stress equals the tensile modulus times the, uh, times the strain, and this is just a spring. We can all agree that a spring has this behavior, pure spring. Now how about we increase the temperature to Tg? Now we are solidly in the leathery. I have no idea, by the way, why it's called leathery. I don't think leather really has the mechanical properties of a leathery polymer, but there it is. And you apply, again, the, uh, the step stress, but now you have a time dependence. So now the strain is not going to respond immediately because the polymer molecules need time to rearrange to accommodate the, new, uh, the, uh, the, the load. So you have an increase over time, and then as you release the load from the sample, it's not going to, re to go back to equilibrium immediately, but it will do so over time. But it will eventually recover to, uh, to mechanical equilibrium. So this is, um, this is slow, elastic, recovery. And this is really an idealized state. You could, in, in real systems, you probably won't actually approach, you probably won't actually get there. You'll probably permanently deform the sample a little bit if it's at all viscoelastic. So this could be full or partial. But we'll lean toward full. For the, sake of, uh, for the sake of the model. Now, how would you model this using a spring? We might need another component to emphasize or to embody the viscous part. And that is called a dash pot, which is a piston filled with honey. And this spring and dash pot model are characterized by a spring with a tensile modulus of, uh, of, of E. 
and a dash pot with a viscosity of eta, which describes its time-dependent um, response to shear forces. And this we call a viscoelastic solid. And this particular model where we have in parallel a spring and a dash pot is called a, the Voigt-Kelvin model. Now let's increase the temperature even more to the rubbery flow regime. Question? Yep. Is that a big clitter right next to the piston? Ada. Okay. Viscosity. And it's a dash pot. Okay, now how about the rubbery flow regime? We're not going to get elastic recovery. Uh, we're not going to get total elastic recovery um, anymore. We're going to have a quick response for the rubbery part, it's the part that's still responding elastically, but then we have uh, and then it's permanently deformed. But then when we remove the step stress, we get recovery down to the initial, um, the initial deformation. And this is the rubbery part. And this is the flow part. And this could be marshmallow fluff. What do I mean marshmallow fluff? Take marshmallow fluff and you poke it quickly, assuming it doesn't stick to your fingers. You've got olive oil on your fingers. You poke the marshmallow fluff and it rebounds immediately. But you poke it and you hold your finger there. And then marshmallow fluff oozes back. And then when you remove your finger, it stays there. And this is a spring and a dash pot in series. I mean, marshmallow fluff is an example of a viscoelastic liquid. So this is a viscoelastic liquid characterized by E and eta. And we're not going to go into too much detail um, on this because you can take an entire course in soft matter physics where you will come up with more spring and dash pop models than you care to imagine. And this is called the Maxwell model. Again, these are highly idealized. Materials generally don't behave exactly like this, but they're useful mental models to understand how, um, how objects uh, behave. Now, here you know that you can't completely permanently deform the system in the, in the Voigt-Kelvin uh, model. There's no H in Voigt. I was thinking Voigt drive at UCSD. Because the spring is going to push the dash pot back together completely, or mostly completely. But in the case of the Maxwell model, the dash pot can stay deformed. So a jar filled, a piston filled with honey 
if there's no force pushing it back, like the spring in parallel in the case of the Voigt-Kelvin model, then this is just going to stay elongated. Okay, and then finally, we have the purely viscous regime where we apply the, the, uh, the step stress and the strain just increases and there's no, no elastic recovery. And this would just be, this would just be honey, viscous liquid. So this is a pure dash pot. Viscous liquid. Now let's make things really interesting. More complex models could be necessary. Suppose you have behavior that looks like this, where the stress is applied here and the stress is removed over here. What if you had an instantaneous elongation? Then you had a lazy increase in elongation. Then when you remove the stress, it recovers partially, but not always, and slowly. But, or sorry, it recovers partially, but only to this amount and slowly. Let's postulate what would happen uh, let's postulate a um, spring dash pot model to account for this. Does anyone want to? Well, some of you have the notes in front of you. <laughs> this is actually a. <laughs> it is a. It is a a, a, a void Kelvin model embedded in a Maxwell model. So. Prior to any elongation, you might have this scenario. And then as you apply the as you apply the stress the first spring is going to stretch way out. But because the other spring is in contact with this dash pot, there's some viscosity of the dash pot, and there's another dash pot down here that is keeping it, that is keeping the, keeping this part from elongating. This is instantaneous. So instantaneously, the spring just stretches out. Whoop. But the rest of the system can't stretch out yet. Now, in this regime, after you've allowed the, uh, the dash pot's time to respond, you still have the spring, which is stretched out. And now the dash pot's are getting stretched out. So that the dash pot has time to respond, so the spring in parallel with it can also start to stretch. And this dash pot stretches. Now when you remove the strain, what happens? This spring immediately responds to removing the strain. So it goes back to uh, a nice e equilibrium coiled spring. But this spring is still extended because this dash pot has not had time to return back to equilibrium. <laughs> 
and this dash pot has not had time to, uh, to, to move back to equilibrium. Now, will this dash pot ever go back to equilibrium? No, because there's no spring pushing it back together. So the final state is going to be a spring at equilibrium, a spring at equilibrium in parallel with its dash pot that's totally, uh, totally back to um, its totally contracted closed state. But this dash pot is still stretched out. And by putting the arrows here, I mean that there are, there are, um, there shouldn't be arrows here. There's a force here, a force here, and then force is removed here, force is removed here. And this is what happens uh, over time. Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't after the stress is removed, it would be vertical down for a bit and then curve out? Which, the top this one or this one? Uh, the left one. Left one. Wouldn't the top spring immediately contract so it would be vertical? This is contracted. Yeah, so like, the, after it goes up, it would be vertical down for a little bit and then curve as the, as the dash bar goes down. Um... Yes. Is the rubber flow model it goes uh, down? Um, <laughs> part of part of part of this elastic recover is still embodied in this part. So, so it would just be like a little speaker. Yeah. OK. That is all the material before exam three, which is Friday. Um, next week, we have uh, guest lectures on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, those lectures may be podcasted, but they will not be on YouTube, so please come to class. Um, I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, we have Nathan Janeski from the chemistry department who's going to talk about polymers in uh, drug delivery and cancer therapy and uh, uh, bioengineering. On Friday next week, uh, we will have a special guest lecturer who will talk about um, computational modeling and we'll have a lot of pretty pictures and videos on, uh, that, that show in two and three dimensions the kinds of things that we've been, uh, that we've been talking about using chalk. Uh, and I will have a uh, special office hour time to be determined later today. Sorry, this, the, the time will be determined later today, but the office hour will occur tomorrow for your last minute questions. For the, uh, for the exam. Thank you very much for your attention.